Hi, this is Pastor Rick, and I'd like to welcome you as we dive into 2 Samuel with this message at the King's Table. I want to tell you a story this morning. Is that okay? I want to tell you a story that maybe you haven't heard, and this morning it's an invitation to sit at the King's Table. It's an invitation to sit at the King's Table. Take your Bibles out. How many of you brought your Bibles today? Get them out, find them on the phone, wherever they are, because we're going to be 2 Samuel. I know, you probably haven't been in 2 Samuel for a while. 2 Samuel, chapter 9, verses 1 through 13. And this is a phenomenal story. Have you ever thought that maybe life is just not turning out like you thought it would? When you're young, you have ideas of maybe how life might turn out. And you start in life and you start working for things. And we all have a tendency of doing this. We look around and we see what other people have, right? And we say, well, I like that or I like this or I have this goal. Sometimes from little we have a goal. This is what I want to do and and we aim towards that goal. We say, well, by, by the time I'm 20, I want to do this. By the time I'm 30, I'll do this. By the time I'm 40, boy, that's really old. I probably won't be alive yet anymore. And then we turn 40 and say, wow, I thought this was old, and it's not. And then we keep going and going. And then life happens along the way, right? And things change. And things happen that we didn't account for. We didn't understand Dominic Carter does not see it turning out like he thought it would. The Associated Press reports for political climbers seeking a stage in the media, a platform to join or displace the powerhouses, the man to go through for years was Dominic Carter. Until last month, Carter, a longtime political anchor for the New York City cable news channel with influence that spread well beyond the nation's largest city, recently took a far, fast fall in a bizarre cascade of events that began last month when charges that he beat his wife became public. That led to his being pulled off the air by managers at NY1, revelations of contentious workplace behavior, his wife's recantation of the abuse allegations, and a new story that a day laborer breather or beater, and dubious reports that he was considering suicide. A judge could rule this week on a domestic assault case after papers are filed. This from a man photographed with Donald Trump and Caroline Kennedy, and once introduced by Face the Nation as he was introduced by Bob Schaefer as the person most likely to have his finger on the story about the Kennedy's prospect of becoming a U.S. senator. So this story is a little bit old, but you can see that a fast and far fall. One of my favorite groups is a Christian group called Switchfoot, and they wrote this song called A Beautiful Letdown, and there's some lines in there that I want to read. This is your life. Are you who you want to be? This is your life. Are you who you want to be? This is your life. Is it everything that you dreamed it would be when the world was younger and you had everything to lose? You think back on those. Is this who you thought you would be? Is, are your dreams turning out like you thought they would? The elderly man wonders if he'll ever speak to his children again. The teenager hopes that his friends won't find out about the struggles that his family is facing. The dad, who has been unemployed for three months, does not understand why he cannot find a job. The young couple wonders why their marriage is not working. Does God care about me? Let me take a few minutes here to introduce you to a story that may help us to understand how God cares for us when we're not even aware. And this is from 2 Samuel 
chapter 9, verses 1 through 13. So this is the story of David and Mephibosheth. Let's say that big fancy name together and not the David one. Let's say Mephibosheth. See if you can do it. One, two, three. <laughs> You're going to rush right out and write that name down so you can pass it down to your kids, right? Mephibosheth. It's a tough one, right? And he didn't name him Jonathan or David or something like that. Jonathan, this is Jonathan, King Saul's grandson, Mephibosheth. So Jonathan is King Saul's son, and Mephibosheth is Jonathan's son. So first of all, Saul was the first king of Israel, and he was rejected. He started out humble, but ended up becoming proud. Then Samuel, the prophet Samuel, anoints David as king, and David's the guy that killed some big guy. Who's that? Goliath, right? So David kills Goliath, a Philistine giant that was taunting Israel. Saul becomes jealous of David and tries to kill him, even though Saul is David's father-in-law. It's just a twisted thing. Saul struggled with all kinds of problems. The Bible says that he was tormented by a, a spirit. And so he'd have David come play the harp. David was a really good harp player. But then the, the spirit would come on him and it irritate him. And several different times scripture records that King Saul launched the spear at him, trying to pin him against the wall. So David ends up running. Ironically, Saul's son, Jonathan, is David's best friend. David makes a promise to Jonathan in 1 Samuel chapter 20, verse 42. He says, Jonathan, or it says, Jonathan said to David, Go in peace, for we have sworn friendship with each other in the name of the Lord, saying, The Lord is witness between you and me and between your descendants and my descendants forever. Then David left, and Jonathan went back to town. So Saul and Jonathan end up being killed in battle. Saul and Jonathan's family flees, runs away, but there's a little boy that is crippled for life in the escape. Saul's son Ishbosheth, write that one down too so you can use it. Ishbosheth is installed as king in Israel, and David is king in Judah. Ishbosheth is murdered. Isn't this kind of crazy? And then David brings Ishbosheth's murder to justice. David is king over all of Israel and Judah now. David's reign is made secure over the years. God's promise to bring his enemies into submission is carried out. And then David remembers his promise that he made to his best friend. He remembers the promise he made to his best friend that he would watch over his descendants. So this is where the story picks up. 2 Corinthians, or excuse me, 2 Samuel chapter 9, verses 1 through 13. David asked, is there anyone still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for David's sake? Now there was a servant of Saul's household named Ziba. They called him to appear before David, and the king said to him, Are you Ziba? Your servant, he replied. The king asked, Is there no one still left in the house of Saul to whom I can show God's kindness? Ziba answered the king, There is still a son of Jonathan. Well, he's crippled in both feet. Where is he? The king asked. Ziba answered, He's at the house of Maker, son of Amiel in Lodabar. So King David had him brought from Lodabar to the house, or excuse me, from the house of Maker, son of Amiel. When Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, 
he bowed down to pay him honor. Let me stop right there. Typically, what happened when kings would succeed another king, especially if it was hostile. If it was hostile, they would kill all the descendants, all the family of the previous king. So there was no hope that any descendant of the previous king would ever ascend to the throne. It was a vicious time. And so Mephibosheth has a little bit of concern here about why is David bringing him in. So just keep that in mind here. David said, Mephibosheth, your servant, he replied. Don't be afraid, David said to him, for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that belongs to your grandfather, Saul, and you will always eat at my table. Mephibosheth bowed down and said, What is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? Then the king summoned Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, I have given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. You and your sons and your servants are to farm the land for him and bring in the crops so that your master's grandson may be provided for. And Mephibosheth's grandson, and excuse me, and Mephibosheth, grandson of your master, will always eat at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then Ziba said to the king, Your servant will do whatever the Lord, the king, commands his servants to do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. Mephibosheth had a young son named Micah. And all the members of Ziba's household were servants of Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem because he always ate at the king's table. And he was crippled in both feet. Interesting. A very interesting passage. And there's so much here to unpack. You know, when life is not turning out the way we thought it would, we need to know that God is still in control. I've talked to so many people that have had plans for life that didn't turn out the way they thought. Couples that thought they'd spend their life together end up shipwrecked and split up. Parents lose children and children lose parents and things fall apart. A diagnosis, a phone call can change the future. And suddenly we can feel like maybe things are out of control. It's not fair that this has happened. This was not in my plans. But let's take a look at three ways that David took action on behalf of his promise to Jonathan. Number one, he went looking for Jonathan's family. He didn't passively sit by. He went looking for Jonathan's family. He says, is there anyone still left in the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? I mean, there's a lot that goes into this, a promise that he made. Verses 1 to 3, we find that David finds Ziba, one of Saul's servants. He asks him the same question. David really could have just waited until maybe he ran across somebody that was from Saul's house. He could have waited till one of the family members came to him. No one would have known any better if we, he would simply have done nothing. Then number two, he did locate a family member. He located one because... Ziba says there's still, or excuse me, the servant says there's still a son of Jonathan. He's crippled in both feet. If you were to go back and 
read in 1 Samuel, find out that as they are escaping, Mephibosheth had a nurse that took care of him. And as they were escaping, she tripped and fell with him as he was a little boy, a baby. And because of it, he was crippled in both feet. Back then, obviously, the the medical stuff was not what it is today, so maybe his feet were broken. We assume something profound happened, but it never got corrected, and he was crippled in both feet. So in verses 3 through 7, David finds Jonathan's son, Mephibosheth. He confirms that, yes, he is crippled, and he is the son who was dropped by the nanny when he was five years old. Mephibosheth was living on the other side of the Jordan, the Jordan River, at a house and maker in Lodabar. So he was away from, he did not stay anywhere close (laughs) to the king. Why is that? Remember I said a lot of times the king will wipe out any of the rest of the family. David could have just checked on his welfare. Let's go see how Mephibosheth is doing. Let's make sure he's taken care of. He could have counted his letting you know Mephibosheth live. He could have just said, that's the kindness. I've checked on him. That's the kindness. But David moved beyond what he could have gotten away with. He did not stop with what was easy, David moved to the extravagant. I mean, he went above and beyond what anyone would have expected. So number three, he provided for Mephibosheth. He provided for Mephibosheth. So what's he say? I says, I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather Father Saul. That's amazing. Just stop there. Think about that. How much land did King Saul own? And suddenly, Mephibosheth, who's living in some other place, some other house, some other town, far away from the palace, suddenly... Mephibosheth is moved. And then David says, and you will always eat at my table. Suddenly, everything changes. Everything changes. Mephibosheth's life fell apart at five years old. He can remember that he used to run around and play with the others. But everything fell apart. And he's crippled. And everyone around him was dying. And he ran and remembers what it's like at the palace. But now he's living far away. He doesn't do much. And I'm sure that Getting around was really tough. And as a cripple, many people would not accept him. What's David do? He restores his inheritance. Now Mephibosheth is wealthy. He assigns Ziba to farm the land. Now Mephibosheth has servants. He restores a place at the king's table for Mephibosheth. David is fulfilling a covenant promise to Jonathan. There's nothing that Mephibosheth did to deserve what David was giving him, was doing for him. Nothing Mephibosheth accepts his kindness, but with extreme humility and probably a little bit of fear. Why would David do this? What would we say in our society? What's the catch, right? What's the catch here? 
What's he want out of this? What's, what's on the other side of this? Mephibosheth is being restored even though he's poor and he's lame. With no great works to his name, he's spent his whole life depending on others. I know this is kind of crazy and this is definitely not a Polaroid, but I found a picture of Mephibosheth. And I know that, you know, it's not obviously a Polaroid and it's not an actual picture, but I want to show it to you. Can I do that? You guys interested in seeing what Mephibosheth looked like? Let me find it here. All right. So I can't believe, you know, what Mephibosheth looks like. You ready to see this? Can you see it? You see what Mephibosheth looks like? You see him in there. It's not easy to see that he's crippled in this picture. It's not easy. Sometimes the injury is most often hidden from view because you, you, my friends, me, we're Mephibosheth. A lot of times, our injuries are compensated for. We don't understand how broken we are, but we remember before we got dropped. We remember when life was simpler. We remember what our dreams were. Mephibosheth was supposed to be a prince, a king. But he ended up being somebody else's problem. You see, there's another person that David based his promise on. Another king who made a covenant promise, and that was God. And he went looking for you and me. He noticed a place at his table was empty. And he loves you so very much, and he wanted to show you his kindness towards the the family of Adam. The very first. The promise has been since Genesis. Since the fall of mankind. God made a promise to redeem us. He found you. He found you in despair. In sin with no hope for the future. He came to us and he bled and died. We just Acknowledge that. He took us on with our crippled, fallen nature. Think about how life has treated you. What is broken inside of you? What is crushed? What will never be the same? But you can remember the days when the days were good. And there was a lot of hope and not a lot of brokenness. Our souls were dead to him. We were dead dogs. Unlike Mephibosheth, we did not humbly and quickly accept his grace. But he's provided for you. Jesus has provided for us. Our inheritance as the children of God has been restored. Philippians 4.19 is a verse, one of the only times my mom sent me a verse 
in college. I was struggling. I was having a hard time paying bills and it just everything was coming at once and I was overwhelmed and she knew that. And she sent me, she used to travel. She sent me a letter with an envelope and a stamp and I got it out of my mailbox. It wasn't electronic. And she had handwritten in there, Philippians 4.19, for my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. I have not forgotten that. God has always taken care of me and he always will take care of you. Jesus set for us a place at his table. And we have an invitation to dine with him at the wedding supper of the Lamb. Do you understand that? You have an invitation to dine at the king's table. You, you my friends, God loves you in your broken, messed up state. Just like King David loved Mephibosheth in all his brokenness. We have so much to be thankful for. We want to praise him in a powerful way to say thank you and to humble ourselves before the king. I'm gonna, but we want to leave here today understanding the extravagant, powerful, wonderful grace of our Lord. Maybe you're kind of in life and you're like Mephibosheth. You're just doing life. You're just kind of letting things happen as they come. The king came knocking. Will you answer? Will you go sit at the table? Will you accept his invitation? All broken up. Life has not turned out. The way that I thought it would. But God blesses us anyhow. Lord, today, maybe something has awakened in us. Maybe we've understood the whole idea that you are pursuing us. It's not out of anything that we've done. It's because of who we are. That's why David went looking for Mephibosheth. It's because of who he was. It's because of who we are. We are your children that you want restored, reconciled. The invitation, my friends, to sit at the table is real. The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords out of Philippians chapter 2, for Jesus is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, that at the name of of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. Amen. I want to put the invitation out there. Maybe you've never made Jesus your Lord and Savior. Maybe you've never crossed that line. You sat in a pew You've come to church. You've danced around it. You've said, I believe in God. That's great. Even the demons believe in God. But Romans 10, 9 and 10 says that if we will confess with our mouths that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that he's been raised from the dead, you will be saved. It's so important. Come sit at the table. It'll be a great time for all eternity and the calories don't count.
So there you go. You're dismissed.